Hi, I'm Carl, and uh, this is my gamma spectroscopy setup. But uh, unlike the usual configuration where I'm looking at a uh, pulse height spectrum on the screen uh, to identify radioisotopes by their uh, gamma ray energies, in this case, the uh, multi channel analyzer is being used to uh, convert uh, gamma ray energies to audible frequencies. And I owe this idea to uh, a couple very enterprising guys in uh, Sweden who presented a, uh, a musical instrument, in essence, based on this principle at the uh, TEDx uh, Yotabori uh, event. And uh, they did a much better job than I could, so uh, please check out their stuff. I think their website is uh, radioactiveorchestra.com. But uh, this, is a, uh, this is a very uh, weak imitation, I would say. Uh, however, I think it has some, some notable differences, and I'll just discuss my approach to, uh, to doing the same, same thing, in essence. Um, first of all, uh, this, is a, uh, this is a means of detecting gamma rays. So there's a 2x2 uh, two two inch uh, sodium iodide detector here. Uh, it's got a base that contains the power supply at 900 volts and a uh, preamplifier, charge sensitive preamp. Uh, that's followed in the signal chain by a shaping amplifier. This is a delay line amplifier. It's very typical for uh, scintillation uh, spectroscopy applications. Uh, analog digital converter. This takes the uh, signal from the amplifier and turns it into a digitized uh, signal. Uh, in this case, uh, divided into uh, a span of or uh, 1,024 channels, and uh, then finally we have the MCA, which is essentially uh, memory that uh, can be accessed by the ADC and also by the computer that can interpret the uh, the spectra that are acquired into the MCA. So anyway, that's the hardware. Uh, as far as the software here. Um, I wrote a little program in LabVIEW, and I'm a terrible programmer, but LabVIEW is just like electronics, and so it's easy, and uh, I don't have to worry too much about my lack of competence in LabVIEW. Um, I'll go ahead and run the program and uh, show you uh, and let you listen to uh, what it does. So let's go ahead and get this started. I will move the camera down near the speaker output of the uh, netbook here. And you'll notice the occasional chirp uh, that would correspond to uh, just background gamma rays being detected. Let's put some sort of source that's uh, more intense near this detector. Let's put some uh, americium-241 in that vicinity. So I will bring the camera down near the speaker and Americium is coming towards the detector. So there's the americium. You hear it makes a certain uh, pitch, as well as a uh, as well as a volume effect. The volume is uh, regulated by how many counts total appear in the. Uh, pulse height spectrum. So when a lot of counts are uh, accumulated into the spectrum in the period of time we're analyzing, the volume is raised. The, uh, the pitch, or the frequency, is controlled by the energy of the gamma ray. So if you can think of a gamma spectrum being overlain on a piano keyboard, that's in essence what the program here is doing. So again, americium-241. Let's now listen to something else. Let's uh, let's go for a higher energy uh, isotope, uh, cesium-137. Americium-241 is uh, about 60 keV. Uh, cesium-137, 600 keV, ten times higher. You hear that warbling? Cesium-137, 
Let's go to an even higher energy. Let's uh, listen to uh, Cobalt 60, which produces two energies, both above one MeV. Uh, so this is a very high energy source compared to the others. And again, uh, americium. Hear that low frequency sound. Cobalt's or uh, season one thirty seven. Sort of a mid range pitch, and finally. Cobalt 60, where you have some very high pitches in there and, and quite a variety of, of sounds, actually. That's a pretty exciting one. Um, now I'll demonstrate a weak gamma emitter. Uh, polonium 210 emits at 803 kV. So uh, I'll put the uh, speaker near the camera. Take the source away. So that was polonium 210. What else do we have here? Let's try lutetium. This is uh, lutetium metal. Uh, it emits a couple weak decay gamma rays. This is one of the primordial radionuclides, a minor one, not too many people know about it. It's quite expensive too. Uh, both are in the vicinity of about 300 kV, 200-300 kV. So now I'll remove the lutetium. All right, so that was lutetium. Um, let's, uh, let's listen to, uh, how about some europium? This europium happens to be in the slag from a nuclear test at the semi palatinsk test site and then the, uh, in Kazakhstan, the former Soviet Union. Um, this is from the Balapan test. And uh, most of the activity is europium-152 and 154 now. Again, it's not a strong source, so I'll put the camera near the speaker. An audible gamma spectrum of europium and uh, slag from a nuclear bomb back in uh, the 1960s in the Soviet Union. Now I'll bring out some real strong sources so we can see what happens when I bring those near the detector. First is a bottle of thorium nitrate, very old in equilibrium with its decay daughters. Here we go, this is the stuff. Kind of overloads the detector. You see a dead time, uh, dead time meter swing up there. That's a bit much for, for this uh, scheme. Um, finally, uh, how about some uh, radium paint in a vial made by a United States Radium Company way back in the day. And it's hot. Even way up here we're hearing. That's a bit much, I would say, for, for that guy. Anyway, uh, music made by uh, Gamma Spectroscopy. Um, I wish I was technically more competent at this. Anyway, I will show uh, the details of how the program works. Um, it's really not complicated, and I probably did a poor job, and other people will have suggestions on how to improve it, and uh, I welcome those. and. We'll try to do a better job next time. Looking at the uh, diagram here of the LabVIEW code, this is where I initialize the MCA. When the program starts, this tells it what to do. So for instance, we're going to use 1024 channels. I have a lower limit of detection so we don't get noise and pile up interfering with what we're doing. 
um, and uh, I am going to tell it to take samples uh, for durations of 20 milliseconds, 0.2 seconds. Uh, so this is the interval over which the uh, the MCA will collect uh, data. Then I configure the uh, sound output task, and this consists of uh, telling it how many samples to collect, to sample continuously, and uh, so forth. Then we start the main loop in this program. And the first thing in the loop is this uh, delay uh, after, the, uh, after the MCA is, is told to uh, erase its memory and start, we have to provide a delay so that it can go ahead and finish collecting that data and transferring it. Um, that's this step. Then we ask it to send the, uh, the uh, array of data, in other words, uh, counts versus channel, uh, out. This array, uh, we search for the maximum value, in other words, what channel contains the most counts, and again it's only a 20 millisecond uh, uh, spectrum, so there are likely to only be uh, a few dozen counts in there, but some of those bins will have more than one count. Uh, in fact, some will have two or three counts. Um, so we find out what channel has the the highest number of counts. We take that channel number, and then we convert it to a uh, to a musical note, and uh, the note to a frequency according to uh, twelve tone uh, equal temperament. There are many other ways you could do this. Um, in our case, we have a wave generator right here. Wave generator. Uh, is configured for the um, sawtooth wave shape. This is rich in harmonics and produces sort of a stringy tone quality, which I like and other people may find very annoying. Um, but uh, we also modulate the volume according to the total number of counts received in that 20 millisecond interval. So intense sources will obviously receive more counts and uh, we produce a higher volume, even though the frequency is determined by uh, sort of an attempt to figure out where the mode or the the, the maximum uh, where the most counts have fallen in, in the bins of that spectrum. Finally uh, we have a exponential decay so typically a, a musical instrument will uh, have uh, some sort of attack and decay profile that determine uh, its some of its tone quality. Here we just have an exponential decay um, this does sound a lot like sort of a uh, uh, a dulcimer or something like that configured with the sawtooth and the exponential decay. But uh, above it, all that it just sounds kind of crappy because of the uh, sampling rate and so forth. There's a lot of adjustments that could be made. But that's the essence of this program. Uh, it's really very simple in principle. Uh, the devil is in the details of course and making it sound as good as those gentleman in Sweden uh, is uh, not where I can expect to shine, but uh, this is, in any case, this is uh, another approach to doing the same thing, which is audible gamma spectroscopy. And uh, I'm curious what other people do with this kind of idea, and uh, if you have suggestions for me, please let me know.